My name? Your original birth name. Erdeny. My name is Erdeny. Buiz. B O U I S E. Erdeny Buiz. Tell them how you got the name Jerry. Jerry Lewis. My great friend Jerry Lewis. He he and Dean Martin were um, always on the ra- on the television, and I thought that Jerry Lewis was hilarious because he was such a clown, and he was so nice at his clown, and and he was so nutty. And um, I used to love to see Jerry Lewis. He used to put the TV on quick and sit down and watch him go through his antics. And I left home when my husband and I broke up, and I went up to the Dewdrop fleeing from home and family and wound up uh, singing on the stage and everybody is in the dewdrop trying to give me a name I said well I don't have a name just Erdeny we can't call that name we can't say that nobody every time they would say it they were chewing it up they couldn't say Erdeny okay so somebody says well what what names other people call you I said Jerry, they call me Edna. I said, but I don't like that. Edna is not my name because it's not me. And I was walking around. You like to be like Jerry Lewis. Why don't you say Jerry? Tell him to call you Jerry. Okay, so I became Jerry. And it stuck. So she was a clown before she became a clown. Always a clown. (laughs) A clown right now. Whether you know it or not, clown right now. Always a clown. Always a clown. If you're wondering about her last name, Paul, that's her married name. She married the brother of Rosemary Paul Domino. That's Domino's wife. Yes. That's how she was just off fast playing at the Hall house before she even, they even got married. And Reggie Hall, who's still leading a band here. So uh, go ahead. Anybody Dorothy. know anything about the Dewdrop? On the South Street. Yeah. Meet your five buddies. Meet your five guys. Girl, your buddies and your pals down in New Orleans on the street. You call the South. Let the Dew Drop in. Little Richard and Both of them. They were constant visitors to the Dew Drop every year. Let's see. This is September, October. All the performers and band leaders and band uh, musicians they all come to the dew drop this time of year and some of them stay and some of them come and go until New Year's and afterwards and we would have a hilarious time in the dew drop on the South Street this time of year all the way to New Year's we have Ray Charles we have uh, uh, let's see Charles Brown the Midnighters. Oh. But what Joe Turner lived there. Um, he came. He came from. Joe Turner came down from Chicago, and made the Dewdrop his home. He stayed there, coming and going. He did three, three records at Cosmos, I think, while he was there. Huh, guys? Yes, Yeah, I don't. Yeah, but I know he made three. He had good ones. Good hits. Who's that? Fats played the piano with Dave's band in the first one he got in 1950. Huey Smith played on one of them, too, from what I know. I mean, what I've heard. I'm not sure. <laughs> I've been told that because I wasn't was, there. The big one is Honey Hush, and he used Edgar Blanchard's band on that. And TV Mama, one with the big wide screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but do you, and you, had a, you got to know Little Richard really well during that time. Yeah. That. Yeah. Richard was a wild hair. Rich came through and blew up everybody. He took over everything. Richard was that kind of person, just like he shows on TV. That's the same kind of human he's always been. He likes his music. He likes his fun. He likes to get wild. He likes to play. And he likes to visit. If he gets to know you, he's coming to your house. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But he doesn't mind, you know, because he's very nice and he'll bring something to eat and Come on, let's go out and have a good time. That's how Richard was. He passed by your house and pick you up and let's go to dinner. 
you know, for him to spend his money wasn't anything if he was your friend. He, Richard was really a personable person, even though he was wild. Nice. Real nice. No problems. And, uh, and you went to a session or two with uh, Cosmos with Richard, you remember? Yeah. What, what was it? Slipping and Sliding? Uh, Long Tall Sally? And uh, a couple of others. Hmm? Tutti Fruity, yeah, that one at that time too. All of those came out around the same time. He recorded them in Kyle's studio. And Kyle said, all right, y'all. Y'all coming in here? Y'all gonna have to be quiet. Stand around the wall because the place is not big enough for chairs. Oh, we had a ball. We had a ball. And little Richard would stand at the piano and scream and holler and beat on the piano. And Kyle said, all right now, save the keys now. Save the keys. He did. He said, look, he said, you're going to give me some money to get it fixed when you get through beating it? Richard said, oh, don't worry about that. He said, all right, then beat it if you want. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Uh, let's see. Is there anybody else that uh, Guitar Slim came through there? And... Well, Slim was, Slim was, um, let me see. He was one of the people from around the Dewdrop. That's where I met him. And, uh, he was always gone. He was always on the road, and he was always traveling. So I never got a chance to write, really get to know Slim, except for a few, you know, like listen to him music, listen to his music, and listen to him play. But Slim wasn't a person that you could really get to know. Same thing as uh, Smiley Lewis. You didn't, you didn't get into them, and you didn't talk too much to them. If they talk to you, you talk. If they don't talk to you, you don't bother them because they were too much into their own thing. Now, Slim was good. He was good, but he was wild. Uh, One, full, get wild. full of liquor. Get full of liquor. He get loud. He plays guitar so loud you have to go outside. I mean, he was really wild. But he played his music, and he, and he liked the tunes. The tunes he would play were always good to listen to, and they were always something that made you feel, you know, Let's play and let's dance or let's have a drink. Guitar Slim was like that. And he would dye his hair and his suits and everything. Tell Guitar me. Slim wore orange suits. Bright green. Bright yellow. He he dyed his shoes. The first time I heard Slim, this I don't know whether you know this. He was living down the street from me. He had a, a, a room in a row. Uh, uh, rooms. They just the, the man next door had a, a grocery, and he had uh, he had built rooms. We lived kind of in the country, in the night ward, below the canal that blew away. And I'm going to the grocery store for my mother, and I hear this loud, loud guitar, just twanging, and this man screaming and bellowing the blues. And I'm walking, and I notice that. The more I walk in that direction, the closer I was getting to the noise. I'm here. And when I get there, this man is sitting on the stoop, on the sidewalk like that. And he's got the guitar in his hand, and he's just screaming and singing loud as he can. And I looked at him, and he had on a purple hat. He had on a purple hat and an orange suit. I never will forget that. I said, who in the world... And he didn't even stop to notice me and I passed right by him. He was just into his world. And I went in the grocery, he was still loud. I come out the grocery, he was still at it. So I just went on back home. I never I never saw him again. And then when I get to the dewdrop and I'm living uptown, and they say guitar slim, and who comes through the door but this man with these loud clothes? I said, That's guitar slim, he got a green suit on. I said, Why, why you wear such wet? such loud clothes somebody holler that's who he is don't you hear how loud he hollers yeah that's him and that's how I got to know Guitar Slim then after a while maybe about two years after knowing him uh, I met some band members like Oscar Moore was his drummer and Oscar was a friend of mine Oscar was a real docile sensitive person Oscar said Jerry we're going to make a run. You want to come for the ride? Read the road map for me. I said, Oscar, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, come on, man. 
It's not going to be long. We'll only be gone two days. So we were gone, and I'm on the road, leading the road. What, what the highway are we on? And look at it and find this one, and we got to go that way. And I made a road trip with Guitar Slim. Wow. And it was nice. Slim was a different person altogether off the stage. He took care of you. He made sure we ate. And he, he was just a nice dude when he wasn't carrying on in his liquor. Because don't let him get five beers anymore, two shots of whiskey. He was off and loud and twanging. But Guitar Slim. Music people, I find music people all have definite identities about music. They're all artists about music. So how did you first, oh, in case anybody doesn't know, Guitar Slim's very good for us with the things I used to do. Lord, things I do that no I used to do. Lord, I won't do no more. Yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah, I was hoping for another group. <laughs> so Not anyway, much. but uh, how did you get into singing? And what was the first impetus that you had into singing? <sighs> Huey Smith. Uh, singing around the dude rock. Danny? Um, let me see. No. To be positively frank, I was working in the dude rock and I used to all the time sing with the record box. You were waiting. And, uh, no. Just work the bar. Keep the bar clean and serve the customers. Keep it clean. Pack the box. Make drinks. Bar made. I had worked downtown as a barmaid before, so it wasn't hard for me to do that. And uh, Frank gave me the job because I lived there. Huey came, was it Huey? Yeah, it was Huey because Bobby Marchand, I came in the bar one evening. And Bobby Marchand, you had never seen Huey, never seen Huey. All the entertainers, the musicians, you never see Huey Smith, but you'd see Bobby every now and then. So this evening, I go in the bar, and um, Bobby's sitting up on the bar. They're playing records on the box. And Huey came in the door and sat down with him. And um, Bobby said, good evening, Miss Jerry. So I went behind the bar, and I put my bag up. And um, Bobby says, I want to ask you a question. I said, what? I said, what did you want? He said, um... You think you want to sing with the clowns? You want to sing with me? You want to sing? I said, Bobby. I said, oh, clown, leave me alone. He said, that's what I want. I want you to join the clowns. And he, and he turned around and said to Huey, isn't that right, Huey? Don't we want her to join the group? And Huey said, yeah, Bobby, Bobby. Bobby thinks you can do that. I said, really? I said, he said, can you sing with the group? I said, sure. I said, that's not a hard thing for me. And Bobby said, no, Miss Jerry, not the way you clown. It's not hard for you. All the time singing with the record box. Always smart ass, Bobby. You know, Bobby, he always, always give you sharp words. So I said, um, I think I might try that. Bobby said, well, it's, it's 9 o'clock and we got to be leaving here by 11. He said, go upstairs and get some clothes and come on back. And that was it. We went to Atlanta, Georgia. That was my first gig with Huey Smith and the Clowns. But now, he's he's right. Bobby and, and Huey weren't the first ones. I sang with Little Millette and the Creoles first. Remember I told you? Little Millette, the rich woman thing. Yeah. The plant song, rich woman. That, I, that was it. Little Millette. Yeah, well, yeah, but I sang, I did um, with Clarence Samuels. Clarence had sent for a girl from Atlanta, Georgia, and um, she couldn't come. And uh, he's, we sitting around the dewdrop, and he said, Miss Jerry, you want to go with Larry Donnell and sing? I said, me? He said, yeah. He said, I got a couple of gigs up in North Louisiana. And I made that gig for about two weeks. We went to Port Allen, and we went to uh, um, Fort, Worth, Fort Worth, Texas. Sedalia, Louisiana, and then we came back home, and I stopped, just stopped dead, nothing else, you know, 
And I think it must have been about a year and a half later before Huey came up with this idea about me going with him. I had forgotten all about Little and letting the Creoles, but we had a good time. Yeah, and I couldn't remember none of my lines. Every time they would start my songs off, I'd forget everything. And somebody would say, a word or two, and it, I said, oh, and it come to my mind, and I'd start singing again, and I got through the gig. The gig came out beautiful. Everybody says, oh, Jerry, you did great. I said, I did. I said, how'd it sound? I don't know. You sound good, man. I said, I sound good. I said, I don't even know how I sound. Yeah, well, you don't worry about it. Keep on singing, because you're doing all right. Okay. So from then on, it was just the music box and me. Next thing you know, Huey is asking me on the gig, did I take that with flying colors? Yes, yes. indeed. Whoop, go on singing. Everybody asks me right now, I said, will you ever sing again? I said, I don't know. I said, if somebody like Huey comes through here and grab me up, I'll go. Yeah. But I ain't going to sing for everybody. All right, no. I, got, I got a surprise for you. Right. A little visit from your friend Bobby Marshan, the late Bobby Marshan. What you have? They've been a show from 25 oh. years ago, courtesy of Miss Beebe. Where is Miss Beebe? Uh, she's actually she's here today, but I would love to see Beebe. Well, I got Jerry, too, because I felt a good need of a uh, lady, you know, a beautiful young lady in the group, because I've been working in the head of the Saturday uh, thing. We were kind of going to be talking about that at the time, so... I hired Jerry to cook the sausage very nice for me and I made it at the time. She does. Yeah, I can tell you very much. Oh, yes. Oh, the baseball was... Oh, no. Oh, no. But during that time, I just had uh, three babies in the group. Golden Bell, Gene, and John. John, the late John, he's gone there for so he's a wonderful folk. He's a wonderful player. And then uh, uh, we decided to count him off. He had so many. I was there and asked, I put it into the shelf, you know, when we found, mm-hmm. I mean, we came to the organ, they got put the prayer for the big show in the and I guess what I did, I put them all in silk for the Rudy Suits, for the Rudy Suits, it's shocked out of toy, tore the whole thing down, all that year, that was a surprise. Did John laugh at you? I don't know what, all of them, all of them, they couldn't believe it, now we tore them all that way to the feet. Yeah. How did you discover? Oh, I'm sitting down. Tell you gotta do it. I didn't tell my Jerry. Always did things like that. She'd be singing, you know. She'd be singing different bands, and she'd sing about those things very nice. And she looks very good. She'd be be an ad home to the group, you know. We'd be only in the group. And uh, from the Rayfield drop down, I put Jerry in. The young man in Rayfield wasn't. Well, they didn't know too much about it. So, <laughs> when he dropped out, I just had Jerry back to the city. So, I put Jerry in. And then Booker, James Carroll Booker, rested. Right? So, the late day, great day, Carroll Booker, he wanted to go in since Jerry was coming in. So, you know, he was. So, he was in the body. Take the group on the road. I don't stand for me to leave you all the way. Yeah, I know that. So I, there, was, there was no change because James Carroll Booker played the piano just like he did. Exactly. And I had to take James Carroll Booker and put it on the piano. And that kind of clown uh, went on the road. But I do All we would do is we come in. I think they're all the business. I think all the money, I took it back to his wife and everything else they all the group. Because they're all the business. And so uh, we come in to record the record Texas and say, you were writing stuff. And have it all set up. All we do is come and record, go right back on the road. Hmm. So, how about that? Bobby's, a, like, like you, he's always cutting up a clown, huh? Oh, is he? he always was. And he always had something, something sharp to say. And he would always say something to you that had you laughing. And he would always say something to you that would put you down if you couldn't stake it. Uh, he but, would stick you. We can't. Talk about Bobby. Of course, Bobby had a huge number one hit of his own called There's Something on Your Mind yes. in 1960. And, and basically, that's when he quit the clowns. But uh, we can't uh, leave him out without mentioning his female impersonator side. And that Ooh. was a very big thing at the at the Dewdrop Inn. And 
is very big in New Orleans at that time, wasn't it? Bobby was a dancer and an MC, and Bobby had a powder puff review of gay dancers and let me see what else did they do. He had about seven gay people with him. They were dancers and, and uh, oh, one of them was a fire eater and one of them was a snake dancer. I can't think of the names right off. But Bobby used to come to Rampart Street at the Astoria and put on this show. And it, and it was called the Powder Puff Review. And Bobby Marchand would do his little dance and tell his jokes and sing, and he would tell everybody about the show, and he would tell everybody about each one of his performers and what they could do. And after he finished telling you about what each one of them could do, they would all come out as he'd call each one, and they'd do a little show how they perform, you know. <laughs> yeah, they'd, they'd do a little twist and make themselves look like, you know, well, here I am, I'm presenting me. And uh, he did that with each one, and then after they all would do the run and go backstage, then he would call them on one by one and they would do their show and they would perform. It was beautiful. They were pretty, weren't they? Yes, they were. Did they had beautiful costumes. Outfits? No, I didn't even know Bobby. <laughs> I just knew he had that, that review. Yeah, but he, he played it straight while he was with the clowns. When he went back to his solo career, then he would do both, he would dress both ways. <laughs> we had, we had, uh, we went to Baltimore one one time. I think it was right behind. Don't you just know it? Uh, Bobby went into this thing where all of us were going to pull off a, a stunt on the public. Bobby was going to dress gay, and all of us, like all the rest, I had to dress like a guy. All right, I'm the only one who had to be the guy. I had to have on a suit like I was a guy, and he made Roosevelt. And he made Eugene, all of, and himself, all of them had on dresses and wigs. And he put my hair red and put me in a suit, like a man, and put a hat on my head. And that was what he left. I mean, that was one of the stints that he pulled while we were on the road singing. He never did it again, but he did it that night in Baltimore. What was that thing about the, the pregnant thing? That might have been with someone else. Uh, yeah, because yeah. yeah, you know he had he had changed the group up about three times. And they put a pillow under their shirt or something. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Tell us about did that one. We mentioned Booker. Booker was a dear friend of yours, and he actually wrote your first solo record. Tell, tell us. We just saw a wonderful. Film. You know about Schoolboy. You know about Schoolboy. Yeah, I, I've got it on here. We can get to the end of the tape. <laughs> really? We got four songs on there. Really? Yeah. Because I haven't heard that record in so long. Booker wrote that. Booker wrote that. Booker was that is a uh, how you I I don't know how you how you say things uh, how you can tell someone about a person like Booker. Booker was unique. Booker was wise, smart, and unique. Cosmo know about Booker. Because he Booker had Booker came home. Uh, I'll tell him to the dew drop one day, and he had a whole stack of books. He had been to the library, and Booker had a whole stack of books on symphony music and other kinds of music and something else. And I asked him, I said, what are you, what you doing with those books? I'm bringing them to school. I said, what are you going to school? He was going to college, taking up music, music theory or something like that. And he says, I have to tell this teacher and I have to have these books to show this uh, uh, BS that he don't know nothing about music. It's right here in these books. I said, what? I said, why you want to tell the teacher you don't know? Well, the bitch don't know, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> he don't know. He's saying, here, I got these books. And you open up the book and he show you the page and you read about it. He said, now this so-and-so says such and such a thing. And it's not like that here in this book. I said, Booker, are you teaching the teacher? Of course, because the SB don't know shit about the music. Or how to play. I can play. I can play. I'm the one who can play. 
I said, yeah. That was Booker. But he was sensitive. He was real nice. And he loved me. He thought I was his mama. He come to me with everything. Anybody get on his nerves, he come tell me about it. Anybody talk ugly to him, because he was very gentle. Anybody come talk ugly to him, he come tell me. I said, Booker, I'm not your mama. You're my friend. He said, they're aggravating me. They're doing this to me. They're doing that to me. I said, yeah, but don't come tell me. I said, why are you going to come tell me? I said, my children are somewhere else. That's all right. I'm your little boy. I said, my little boy ain't bad like you, full of mischief and doing everything you got no business to do. He says, I don't care. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> and laugh at you and run off up the street. He had a problem with his aunt, though. He had an aunt that would not let him stay home. She kept him in the street, always running away from her. That worried me about Booker, but oh, that's in the past, thank God.